We could imagine it starts maybe over a small thing in the Taiwan Straits. And before we know it, the entire fabric of the global economy tears apart. And that kind of doomsday thinking has to find its expression somehow also in how we manage money. And so that, but that is new. That is certainly new for me as an adult. Um, it's for the majority of people living on this planet who are younger, it's a completely novel thing altogether. And so, and that has to be also reflected in markets to a degree somewhere. Welcome to the Tao of Chow podcast. This is a podcast about macroeconomics, geopolitics, global finance, investment themes, retirement planning, and behavioral finance, where we will try to find balance and provide a clearer path forward in this uncertain world. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing my friend, Dr. Elliot Hentoff from London. He's the head of macro policy research on global macro team at State Street Global Advisors and is responsible for research and thought leadership linking policy impulses to financial markets and economics, stuff that we really, really, really need today. He also serves as the company's chief geopolitical strategist, also something we really, really, really need today. He joined uh, State Street uh, from uh, Standard & Poor's Sovereign Ratings Group, where he was a director and lead analyst for sovereigns and government-related entities in Central, Eastern, and Mediterranean Europe. Elliot holds a PhD from Princeton University, as well as a master's degree in international affairs from Georgetown University. So, Elliot, thank you for being my guest today. Oh, Philip, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my pleasure. We spend time normally just talking, and today I thought that may be a great idea to let other people hear what we, what we talk about. So, let's get started. So since the uh, Russia special military operation, and I'm using that because that's what Russia calls it, uh, over the 14, uh, 14 months ago uh, in Ukraine and the significant elevation of great power competition between U.S. and the People's uh, Republic of China, PRC, geopolitics or geopolitical factors are playing oversized role today. We expect these risk factors will cast a long shadow over portfolio construction and management as we observe the transition from a unipolar world, that's what we're expecting, to a multipolar and multi-hegemonic world. So further, the, the significant regime change from uber-accommodative monetary policy globally since the uh, global financial crisis through um, uh, COVID to normalizing and restrictive monetary and fiscal policy uh, is occurring at the same time. This is also adding uh, you know, more stress and uncertainty uh, to the world and to certainly to investing. Elliot, I'm, I may also add that one of the byproducts of COVID and great power competition is the struggle between the 20 years of free trade and globalization on the one hand, and then their uneven allocation of benefits that ushered in the trend towards nationalism, or some people call them uh, slobalization or slobalism and regionalization. The oscillation from free trade to restrictive trade is nothing new, as you know. If you go back in history, it's done many times, even though the players are different. So there's certainly a lot of uncertainty. The first thing is really thinking about international and EM investing. And so traditionally, investing overseas and focus us on uh, to take on currency and political risks. And further, that we have... we we. In the U.S., we earn U.S. dollars and we spend U.S. dollars. So in the past 20 years, other developed markets such as Europe, Australia, and Japan, uh, for example, have significantly underperformed. Uh, from the 10-year period from 2001 to 2010, emerging market outperformed U.S. and developed market nine years out of 10. The next 10 years from 2011 to 2020, the U.S. outperformed seven out of 10 years. So, Elliot, with these kind of macro uncertainties that I kind of, you know, discussed briefly, should we still even think about investing in foreign markets? And if so, should we limit these investments to only friendly countries or ally country to lower the geopolitical risk? What's, what's your thought on that? No and yes. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, should we limit uh, investing to home investing? No, there's a, there's a reason why we build portfolios typically portfolios that have grown in complexity and diversities, uh, 
by and large, m most investors seek to build a diversified portfolio. And that diversification means naturally that you, you have to look around across all assets to, to, to reap the diversifying effects that, that you're trying to build into your portfolio. And so yeah. be they equities or bonds or any other types of assets, there's plenty of them, capital markets, real assets outside of the US that deliver very good risk adjusted returns and can fulfill can basically fill a function in the portfolio that you cannot necessarily find in the US market. So I, I want to be very obviously very affirmative on on that that there is there is purpose there. Now what does matter is when you talk about risk adjusted returns basically are you being compensated for the risks that you take on with those investments and you mentioned once you go abroad you also have currency risk that's that's obviously quite different. You have uh, we used to say political risk, but there's plenty of political risk in U.S. markets now too. Uh, so that that perhaps necessarily is not necessarily a different thing. But are you getting compensated? Do market prices reflect the risks you talk about? And that leads me to the second question: Should you limit investments to geopolitically friendly markets? Right. And the answer there is uh, well, I said yes, but. It's also no, as in, yes, you should invest in non-geopolitically friendly countries because again, what it matters is whether you're being paid for that. Are you being compensated adequately for taking on the risk that geopolitics may actually deliver a backlash? And you, you mentioned last year, clearly, if you held assets in Russia on February 23rd, 2022, you probably had a lot of difficulty, if not complete, had to write a, do a complete write-off two, three days later. And so, yes, the question is whether you're being compensated for that risk and whether that risk is adequately priced in the marketplace. So basically, uh, no to the question, should you limit your investments to the US? Yes, you should invest even outside what we would think is our comfort zone. So <clears throat> I, I totally understand that if we go back 50 years, 100 years, there is certainly a diversification benefit. There's a higher opportunity set that we can farm future returns from. The question is really pricing the risk, isn't it? I mean, that's really what you are, you are emphasizing a little bit there. And that risk is geopolitical risk, and which is related to currency risk, and so on. Um, so when we are in, in an increasingly less certain geopolitical environment, in theory, how do you think about pricing risk? And, how, and, and do we really trust the market to price it right? Or it is just going to increase volatility, even though we may get diversification benefit, but we may be losing a little bit of stability benefit. How, how does that sound? Does it sound even right? Am I thinking even correctly in that? The first part of the question is, are markets pricing it right? And the reality is the further away the risk is, or the more abstract, the less it's priced in, because that's not what markets do. Even equity markets, are, you know, which are forward looking, they don't tell you what the economy is going to be doing five years out. They tell you basically what's going to happen a few quarters out. Two quarters, typically, one could argue maybe three. Geopolitical risk tends to be a little bit more of a medium term sometimes long-term risk that materializes gradually over time, sometimes suddenly. And markets have, do a poor job of actually pricing that in. And I, I think, again, back to the Russian invasion, we ourselves were looking at, you know, Russian assets had been discounted. And even though we were skeptical that it would come to a war, we felt the discount applied was not sufficient enough to, to actually lure you in. Um, uh, because... Mm -hmm. The asymmetric risk that you were taking on board basically needed higher compensation. And so by and large, I would say markets do not price it well. And that's, that's good for the likes of myself because that means more employment security. Uh, analyzing <laughs> where, where we think some of these geopolitical risks are actually mispriced. Um, in the bigger picture, are you introducing more volatility into your portfolio as a result of that? Probably, although even that I could possibly pro dispute to a degree because even the U.S. economy, which is relatively closed compared to other economies, the U.S. equity market actually has a fairly large global exposure. So through your U.S. equity holdings, you are importing a lot of these geopolitical risks 
anyhow. So they're, they're present to some degree as a share of revenues of U.S. corporates that they earn outside of the U.S. And therefore, the marginal additional volatility that you're bringing in is, 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 is basically is typically justified given the other benefits from the exposure that you can capture. So this is um, really interesting because I think it's another lesson for us to learn about behavioral biases and that in order for us, uh, even if we don't get 100% right by through diversification, even during this, this heightened period of geopolitical tension and perhaps other things, that diversifying outside of the United States still makes sense. But we have to have a longer view. We, we should not re react to it in a typical manner. Oh, boy, you know, volatility is coming and I, I get out at the wrong time. Uh, in order for it to pay off, it has to be a longer time frame, uh, if, if I may suggest. that you, you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you mentioned the, the first decade of this century. Pretty much every year it was better EMs outperformed uh, yeah. the U.S. and other developed markets. The subsequent decade is pretty much the reverse. Now, obviously, when you see these types of big structural shifts happening, uh, it makes sense to, to shift your relative weights. Uh, but they, they still, you, you do not want to be absent during the years of outperformance because th that, that's when the, the, the major gains accrue. Uh, so, yes, uh, I think that that is probably the, the prudent approach. And that's probably the question is, well, what structural shifts are we seeing now Clearly, right. the 2010s are over. And so maybe it's, yeah. it's worthwhile thinking, well, in the world of the future, where does the outperformance, where is it more likely to reside? For a very long time, um, U.S. Have, have, have dominated, we can call it exceptionalism and all those wonderful things that we talk about U.S., and one of which has to do with technology, uh, has, has to do with, the, with, with our economy and, and our culture in the United States and the, the technological advancement and, and, and allowing failures and allowing um, lots of uh, risk-taking uh, in, the, in, in, in the marketplace. That has not proven to be the case in, 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 in average Europe, uh, where you see all the biggest names are, um, are happen to be in North America, uh, United States, and, and they are not in Europe. How uh, it, the, the future it continues to be uh, sort of technology centric or technology dominant? What, what do you see are the opportunities in Europe or in in, in Japan or in the developed markets for a moment that you gives you maybe some feeling that diversifying into those uh, also not only uh, give us sort of geographical diversification but also allowing us to see a lot of growth possibility. That's where equity is going to shine. Can, can you share a little thought on that? Yeah, I think there's, there's no question about it. The, the U.S. is a technological leader. It will remain a technology leader. Uh, but my question back to you would be, is technology really the only reason the U.S. outperformed for a decade? And the answer is no. The yes. Clearly, there were other drivers present. And so the technology one, that driver remains present in the US, but some of the other drivers are shifting. And one of them was, of course, an ex extraordinarily abnormally low rate environment, globally yes. in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere. Obviously, in a low rate environment, growth assets per se, so obviously assets that ha deliver returns over a longer time horizon because of a lower discount rate, those start to perform better than, than kind of staid, more classic uh, value assets. And that, that's a little bit, a very simplified comparison between the US and Europe as well. So Europe had the second headwind, which was major, was, well, it had a few headwinds in the past decade. One was the load rate environment, which didn't play to the strengths of the companies that were present. Um, and the second one, of course, was that not only did it, was it a victim of the financial crisis in the U.S.? With Remember that the first bank that collapsed in 2007, actually the first two were German banks, German public banks. The next bank was a British bank. So, you know, the, there was a variety of balance sheet pain inflicted in Europe from the U.S. financial crisis. And thirdly, it then had its own partially self-inflicted sovereign debt crisis. So a lot of things went, went bad for Europe in the past decade. And so mm -hmm. some of these drivers are gone. We are not returning to a zero rate environment, even after the next recession. 
uh, rates will stay positive, pro possibly real rates even stay uh, p positive, or at least near zero. Uh, that, that changes the dynamics of kind of the European market versus the US. I'm not saying it necessarily makes it uh, more attractive, but it certainly should make it less unattractive in relative terms. So in relative terms, Europe should do a little bit better. The other thing is that Europe has, still has a crisis today, again, which is kind of European around the energy sector. And so certain industries in Europe are going to suffer quite badly at, from the prolonged loss of competitiveness. Uh, but otherwise, a lot of things have shifted um, perhaps a little bit uh, in its favor. For instance, the pandemic led to a big shift in how Europe is governed. And the way it's governed has really basically upended some of the, the poor policy frameworks that were supporting the continent. So what am I talking about? F well, first of all, you've had the banking system. Remember in Europe, mo more growth is financed through bank loans than in the US. The US, you know, the majority of borrowing happens through the bond market. In, the, in Europe, it's through the banking system. Well, banks were in bad shape because of that financial crisis 10 years ago. They are no longer in bad shape. They're in relatively good shape. And it's, it shows this year, you know, which, which banks are collapsing. It's smaller U.S. regional banks uh, who are, were not prepared for the change in the interest rate environment. Well, Europe has had a much stricter banking supervision in place, so banks are in better shape. So long story short, rate environment is better. The banking system is better positioned. So you get two good macro forces there already uh, with regards to capital allocation. And then the policy framework is better. And the policy framework matters because the policy mistake from 10 years ago, kind of a, a loose monetary, very tight fiscal mix is being upended. You now have a much more kind of normalized monetary and looser fiscal stance. And the fiscal stance in particular, they're not spending more money on pensions. Um, they're spending more money on investment. And investment, public investment in particular, had been very, very low uh, across large parts of Europe, and that is normalizing too. And we know that from a, the multiplier effect that you get on a, a dollar or a euro of public investment typically is positive, meaning for each euro of inv public investment, you typically get a GDP return of one and a half or two euros. And so that, that obviously should be reflected in returns on capital across the region. That is basically what is very different in the coming five to 10 years than the last 10, 12 years. Some of that applies to the US too, but the, the US, uh, just in terms of if you, if you wanted to say what, what's different now versus those 10 years, I would say um, things look in relative terms slightly better for Europe than they did um, over the past decade. A very similar story, by the way, would apply to Japan, but it's other drivers, improvement in corporate governance there, um, some increased immigration, some other structural factors that, that, are, that are shifting. And obviously the return of healthy inflation in Japan makes, makes that also a slightly different story. One other question on Europe. The continent um, is, is more export driven or export dependent, however you want to call it, than the US, for example, is my understanding, historically. How does the geopolitical landscape of perhaps nearshoring, friendshoring, regionalization, fracturing, in the longer view, I don't mean the short term, but how does that get work in the favor of Europe? Or is it not? Or is yet to be determined? For Europe specifically, it's yet to be determined. I think if for other countries, the verdict is more obvious. If you are... are a large emerging market that can play off the various contenders, i.e. the US bloc, the China bloc, you, you could probably do quite well in this world where you basically get concessions from both sides. Um, those are kind of the winners. Think of India, for instance. I mean, India, in a year where it's the largest net energy importer, um, in a year of an energy shock, 2022, actually had a pretty good year, India. Well, why it, it suddenly got access to discounted energy resources, tolerated by the West, actively courted by the East. Uh, and so that's yeah. a classic example of uh, a winner in the world of future trade. A loser is probably those that are stuck 
kind of torn in the middle, too small to play off each side with a mismatch of integration in one block or the other. For instance, I'm thinking of South Korea, where they're economically clearly more integrated with China, but geopolitically anchored with the US. Well, that's, that's, that's not a good place to be in the world where, where trade is fracturing around um, these ge geopolitical contours. Europe is clearly more allied with, with the US, but the, the verdict, why the verdict is, is not over, it's an ally with an ocean in between. And you can, we can see from the news flow every month that there's a little bit of a, a dance going on. China still has some Europe dependency. Europe has China dependency. Um, the US would, would like the, its allies to do certain work. The Europeans would like the US ally to recognize its contributions. And so therefore the verdict is still still open to what degree Europe, how Europe can fare and navigate these these waters. You know, on the upside, I could give you examples of how, well, the Europeans are now, for the purposes of the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, most of the components that come from Europe will be considered as to qualify as kind of being home shored or reshored. Um, that's clearly a success and a carrot that the U.S. has offered to the Europeans. And so therefore, the, some of Europe's companies will actually benefit from the increase in domestic investment in the energy transition in the U.S. as well. And there's not many allies that have that beneficial status. So that's an example of how Europe could actually uh, do quite well. On the flip side, you know, frictions with China, the high dependency on exports to China, a Chinese market that is increasingly hostile to, to foreign competition, i.e. in autos, for example, well, that obviously can be very painful for the European economies. So it's a mixed bag. Uh, the verdict is yet yet to be seen, and therefore it makes sense to pay attention to some of this news because it it, it can highlight and, and point our way as to w where the final verdict may lay. You mentioned China. So the U.S.-China great power competition has you know, moved from codependent trading partner status to strategic rivals and then to Cold War nemesis and now possibly ending in a kinetic event over the Taiwan Straits. I mean, that's almost daily you hear about it. Anti-CCP is the one topic that the Democrats and Republicans can not only agree on, but play one-upsmanship with it. So we are witnessing a growing fracture between the two countries with increasing aggressive language, policies, and actions from both sides. And there's a real chance that the U.S. will prevent most direct investments uh, in China and under the guise of national security, and perhaps to, to even delist um, all China domicile company on the U.S. exchanges and prevent any U.S. dollars uh, from, from assisting China's growth. Um, and, and aid uh, competition. So, you know, uh, China uh, approximately represents 30% of the MSCI Emerging Market Index. With all that is going on on a daily basis, and regardless who wins in 2024, what, what's your thought about investability um, of China? If it is investable, how should we think about it? H how should we think about it? If it is not investable, quote unquote, because I understand many... Um, Large institutions are asking firms like yours and others to say, gosh, you know, I, I'd like you to create a China-only uh, investment and then sort of an index ex-China and let us decide uh, what to do. So the world is going in from an investment standpoint already factoring. I mean, you know, when we think about it, we, we no longer say, oh, just give me a, 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 an EM index and I'm good. If it's 30% China, I'll go with it. I'm just thinking out loud and, and hopefully you can help me to, to think correctly uh, about investing in China. Is it investable? And even if we don't have China in EM, you know, China plays a huge role uh, in many parts of the global south. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, please. well, first of all, Philip, the ho our house view has been, and I've been, I'm not going to lie, I've been a personal driver of this as well is that China does not belong in the EM index and it doesn't belong in your EM portfolio either. It should be a okay. standalone. But not okay. only for the, ge the geopolitics aside, the, the pure fundamental macro performance and positioning of China is so different from any other region in the world, it deserves its standalone allocation. 
it's the only other region outside of the U.S. that can drive its own macro cycle. So you could, we can all be lowering rates across the world. China can be raising them and vice versa. And that's exactly what we've seen the last few years. Yeah. Uh, you know, we can be stimulating fiscally while they're tightening and re the reversal. No other country can actually run against the tide, swim against the tide in the same way. And therefore, it deserves its own standalone allocation just on its own on those fundamental points. Yes, it's certainly investable. It's back to the points I made earlier, which is, are you getting compensated for, for the risk you're taking on? Because you are taking on risks. Uh, make, uh, obviously, you don't have any doubts about this. I think most of your listeners are very well aware. You're taking on considerable risks, and some of them are very idiosyncratic and very particular to China. Uh, and you definitely need to be compensated for that. And we continue to see in the public markets opportunities and valuations at levels where we feel like, yeah, this is attractive. This, this makes sense to be holding it. But obviously, the price has to be right, and it has to sit in the right dimension of your portfolio. I do have concerns as a foreign direct investor, because that's where the risks are greater with regards to the, the, basically the downside risk is certainly much greater than you have in public markets. You know, you, you know it's illiquid. You cannot repatriate. Uh, you're exposed to a variety of additional regulatory legal risks that are, typically are not present in public markets. Uh, that's usually also, you know, it's that opportunity sector that, that makes foreign direct investment so attractive. But the other thing is, that's the China risk, but you also have geopolitical risk, which is that the, the U.S. really, I mean, you talked about U.S. dollars going to China. The, what we really don't, or what U.S. authorities don't want is U.S. technology and expertise going to China. Sure. And that sure. usually comes with direct investment. It does not come with portfolio dollars. It does not come with you or I putting a slice of our retirement money, allocating it to the Chinese stock market. No knowledge transfer or technology transfer occurs in that, that process. And so therefore the risk is also from that front, in terms of kind of from the home front, it is lower. Now, the other thing I would argue also with policymakers is that because that's so, China does not need our dollars. China is a net creditor to the rest of the world. They earn more from the global economy than uh, they they pay back in. And so what they do need, they continue to need is growth and moving up the value chain in terms of their export mix. And for that, they need direct investment. They need engagement with the global, uh, with global capital markets in order to, to help that process along. Uh, but that means that, again, portfolio investment, investing into public markets, equities and bonds, is, bears considerably less risk than the private market angle, direct investments, private equity, real estate that you, where you actually have onshore assets directly um, that may that are heavily exposed. It doesn't mean there's no risk. It just means there's less risk. And so I'm I I am currently comfortable with the amount of risk. Why? Because I know the the Russia case gave us the sense that things can turn overnight. But remember, even in Russia's case, the U.S. warned about an invasion three months before the war. All of us were talking about it several weeks before. And so you as an investor could have chosen at that point to say, you know, I'm no longer comfortable with that and I will repatriate. Well, in the Chinese case, eh, I think we would get a lot of signals along the way that risk is rising. And that would, mm -hmm. there would be repeated opportunities to reevaluate and examine are we still comfortable with our allocation? Would we like to reduce it? Would we like to zero it? And so therefore I'm comfortable with investing today. We may have this conversation six or 12 months from now where I tell you the opposite, but that's because of events over the next six to 12 months that would drive that decision-making. Particularly Taiwan, you mentioned Taiwan. I think it's really important to understand that kinetic event over Taiwan is is a worst case scenario. And yes, in that instance, I'd be not only worried about my China portfolio, but probably most of my portfolio because 
a kinetic event over to Taiwan, it's, it's hard to see how that stays contained without spilling into a global depression greater than the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah. My final message on Taiwan is that between what we have today and a kinetic event, a war over Taiwan, there's a lot of gray in between and a lot of different stages, kind of like think of an escalation ladder uh, where we could be, find ourselves. And whenever things shift, either right before an event or as it, uh, you as an investor have time or the ability to respond. Uh, so some people will say, well, I was completely surprised by the Russia invasion. Yeah, frankly, I, even I as a so-called professional did not expect it a month earlier. Uh, but I would not say I was surprised that the war happened the day it actually did happen. And therefore, I knew that the morning, once it did happen, I also knew that the immediate consequence would be full-on sanctions and exclusion from global capital markets. Therefore, we spend time talking about geopolitics because we see news flow, and that news flow can give us signals for whether to reposition or adjust portfolios based on the risks. So far, we've talked about a lot of uh, uh, uncertainties. Um, degree of uncertainty. So over the next 10 years, uh, I'm just using 10 years as an example, uh, lots of things could happen. Uh, we cannot tell the future. Uh, some, a few things will absolutely shock us and surprise us, I'm sure. It, it seems like, it maybe it's just because we're in it now, it seems like there is an increasing uncertainty. And in, in a world of increasing uncertainty, if I have an in investment horizon of 10 years, I shouldn't just set it and forget it and go to sleep. I really sounds like I need to be um, more um, cognizant and more um, informed uh, over the next 10 years, if I even have a 10-year investment horizon. Or is it just because it's happening now, I just feel more or less at ease and I feel that I need to do more of this? Or has it always been this way? What's your thought on that? No, I, I, th I think the world has profoundly changed. I think it's not, that's no big news. Uh, but the, cha the change is, and really when I say profound, I would say I was still born in the Cold War. As a 10-year-old, there was a thinkable scenario for doomsday. You know, something happens, the US and the USSR, one lobs a nuclear weapon, and before we know it, thousands of them are, and that's the end of human existence. That was a thinkable scenario for me as a child. And then for many decades, it was not. You could, you, you could not in the 90s, in the early 2000s, and even arguably in the 2010s, conjure a, a global crisis of such magnitude that you know, all bets are off, so to speak. And now we're back to that world. We could imagine it starts maybe over a small thing in the Taiwan Straits, and before we know it, the entire fabric of the global economy tears apart. And that kind of doomsday thinking has to find its expression somehow also in how we manage money. Yeah. And so that, but that is new. That is certainly new for me as an adult. Um, it's yeah. for the majority of people living on this planet who are younger, it's a completely novel thing altogether. And yeah. so, and that has to be also reflected in markets to a degree somewhere. That uncertainty, yes, uncertainty is certainly higher. Uncertainty one could say is risk, and risk is sometimes volatility. And so therefore, volatility must be higher structurally, certainly higher than we've had in the past decade, which where we were all, markets were on morphine um, provided by central bank liquidity, but pr pr presumably perhaps even higher than even the pre-2008 period. We, are in a, we live in a world with profound uncertainty uh, because some of it is driven by a small group of human decision makers. And that is something that none of our models and our algorithms can f f fully capture uh, to a degree. So that uncertainty has to be greater. I, th I think I already know your answer to this. And if I do that, uh, I am on the same side as you are, but I'm going to just tease it out. So in February last year, and we talked about <laughs> where we talked about Russia invasion of, of, of Ukraine, and so in February, US, EU, and UK and Canada announced some Russian banks would be disconnected uh, from the SWIFT banking system, which basically cut off Russia's from the international payment system. Furthermore, they targeted Russia's central bank by preventing the Kremlin from accessing its up to about, I think, more than $600 billion 
which is made up of uh, reserve in the U.S. and then U.S. dollar in among other countries. So these type of actions have raised fear in other countries that rely on the SWIFT for commerce and the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. That perhaps one day something like that could happen, right? It's like almost like a coercion by the United States to take arbitrary uh, action against them. So a number of countries have been slowly diversifying away from the U.S. dollar uh, as the sole reserve currency, and in the case of China, has made a number of bilateral agreements to settle trades in the renminbi, and probably have even have more thinking about through this one bell one road or bell and road initiative that all these trades among these other countries, small, much smaller countries, uh, to also settle in in, in, in RMB. So these actions have raised the question, is the U.S. in danger of losing its dominance uh, as a reserve currency status? Thoughts? Well, I've written at least one longer paper on this, and I do encourage people to search its weaponization of the U.S. dollar. What can I tell your viewers that, or listeners that they may not have heard? The first thing I would point out is the big surprise last year was not that the dollar was weaponized. That was not the surprise. The big surprise for Russia and China was that the dollar meant the dollar in quotation marks, i.e. the dollar and all of its friends. Because what did the Russians diversify into when they, took, when they sold their dollars? Well, yes, some gold, but particularly euros, euros yes. and some other currencies. But it turns out holding a euro or a yen or a sterling or a franc or the Norwegian krona geopolitically, they're all the dollar. It doesn't yeah. matter. And now in economic terms and in reserve management terms, yes, they're very different and they have very different uh, performance in a reserve basket. But geopolitically, they're the same. And that was really the big revelation uh, of last year. And so therefore, you're, you're really, um, from a pure FX reserve, central bank reserves point of view, you really have no alternative to the dollar because what we've tracked over the last two decades is yes, uh, there is a search for some diversification in the reserve world, but the diversification are US allied currencies. And so that doesn't give you the hedge for uh, on the geopolitical side. It does give you a hedge uh, in terms of uh, yield differentials, in terms of FX risk and appreciation and, and so forth. Uh, but it does not give you the geopolitical one. So that's one very big surprise uh, from last year. Uh, the, the other one is, again, and I'm trying to focus on things that pe people may not may have missed. It's easy to sanction a country that's dependent on money. It's very hard to sanction a country that has it plenty or is generating surpluses. Now, Russia yeah. is an oil producer, so it generates a lot of surpluses. We, the West, basically sanctioned a large chunk of the surplus, froze the reserves, that's basically the years of surpluses. And then what happened? Well, Russia continues to sell oil, continued to generate surplus. Now, it didn't, doesn't sit on the central bank reserves. It now sits in some Russian commercial bank account. But the end effect is still the same. They're accumulating uh, more money than they're spending. Uh, and so therefore, the, the, the effect of the sanction is meaningful, but we should also be somewhat humbled as to what the effect can be. And that matters because when we think about China, China's risk appetite, their cost-benefit calculations, um, the fact that China continues in today and continue in the future to be a surplus generator also means that financial sanctions would be meaningful, but they are not as powerful as some people may imagine they are. They, for a deficit country, for a country that's dependent on foreign financing, like a, a Turkey with a chronic current account deficit, mm -hmm. sanctions would be existential. Uh, but for, for surplus generators, that's not the case. Now, I say all of that because it takes us back to this whole discussion around surpluses and deficits matter because at the end of the day, we are one world, we're one earth, and things have to net out. And so if you have surpluses on one side, you have deficits on the other, uh, that's how so you sold more goods, the other side bought more goods than they sold, and now you have an asset and a liability mix. Now that has to match up. The ones that 
accumulated surpluses have capital that they have to put somewhere. And they can either put it in their own economies, which means the, their own exchange rate goes up, which China is very reluctant to do. Or if it's in oil countries where the currency is pegged, it, as you, know, you get huge inflation uh, because the domestic money supply uh, goes through the roof. And if you don't want to do that, which is the right prudent choice, well, then you have to invest the money abroad. And now where are you going to put the money? Especially if it's trillions. Now, Philip, imagine I was a client of yours and said, here, Philip, I, I'm not, I, take my three or four trillion and do something with it. But please don't invest it in the US. Well, good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> finding a home with three or four, for three or four trillion, actually it's, it's multiple more than that if you add it all up. Um, but the, the reality is that there is no way around it. And so that's the US dollar dominance is also a reflection of the world we live in. And so as long as the world looks the way it looks, surpluses in one part of the world, deficits in the other, and as long as there's not a real credible alternative, that's dollar dominance, whether we like it, don't like it, whether we want to do away with it, or whether we want to reinforce it, that doesn't matter. It's a structural reality, and it'll be with us for some time. Is, can, can this explain why China is continuing to buy a lot of gold at the moment? I, I would be reticent to say they're buying that much gold. When you read the data mm -hmm. and really carefully look at the data, there's some additions to gold. Kazakhstan, Russia, China were the big gold buyers of the past decade. No surprise, they all had, there's kind of a geopolitical dimension to that. But as a share of their reserves, it's pretty modest. As a share of their economies, it's tiny. And mm -hmm. relative to the, where they were still putting the other surpluses, the dollar and dollar assets still reign supreme. There's a lot of talk that China has reduced its exposure to US treasuries. And even that is, I think, um, wrong, frankly. I think it's plainly wrong. Again, when you look at the data carefully and parse it, if you add in all of China's ex extended balance sheet, both direct and indirectly, it does not strike me even as if the, the exposure to, to US Treasury, so direct exposure to US government debt has declined much over the past five, seven years. And I think it's not for a lack of trying, yeah. Uh, I think it's just for a lack, for the lack of means that are available. So maybe what they are doing is taking their money and lend it to, you know, the Global South, building the, the railroads and, and all that, which, which is one way to make some income and to, to aid in, in many other politically important ways, or geopolitically important ways. Um, but, it, but that also have its own set of challenges as well. And again, even the global South cannot absorb a trillion, right. not even one trillion dollars of that type of lending. So that it's still, there's just capacity limits everywhere you look. That, that's right. That's right. So I, I, I believe that the U.S. dominance in being 60% or more of the global reserve currency remain unchallenged. I mean, on, 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 on the margin maybe, but, but all this talk about losing its reserve status is, I think it um, just makes great news, but uh, not a reality. That you agree with that? Yes. I would just flag one thing. There's a difference between trading currency where the US dollar will lose some of its dominance. Yes, yes. And a reserve currency, basically a store of value. Yes. And the third category, a funding currency. Uh -huh. Both on the funding currency, if I want to, if I'm a big corporate domiciled in the emerging market, I will, it's easier for me to raise money in US dollars. And that will remain the case for a long time to be. And as a reserve manager of a central bank, to store most of my assets in dollars, that too will be the dominance. On the trading side, though, the reality is there, Russia, China, Iran, they can all find alternatives and workarounds to actually do transactions in non-dollar currencies more and more. I want to stay on this call for a lot longer, but I think whoever's listening to it is probably getting a headache because there's so much going on. So I, want to, I don't want to abuse your time, <laughs> Elliot, nor the listener's time, and just want to thank you so much. Uh, every time I speak with you, I, I, I learn something new that I sort of need to sit back, think about, 
and, and I appreciate it greatly. So again, thank you, Elliot, uh, to be my guest uh, and be my friend. And I hope that we will have another opportunity to discuss these and, and, and other, you know, really important events uh, that involves uh, daily lives, actually. So thank, thank you, Elliot. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Thank Philip. You. Thanks for having me. You can always find more episodes by visiting philipchow.us slash podcast or find us on your favorite podcast app. You can always leave us feedback, ask questions, or request a topic for us to discuss by sending an email to pc at philipchow.us. Views expressed in the Tao of Chow podcast are individual opinions, and they do not represent the employers of each guest or the firm each guest is associated. Our podcasts are for educational and informational purposes only and should not be deemed or viewed as investment advice or recommendations. Please consult your personal financial advisor, investment expert, or investment fiduciary before taking any actions about your plan and investments.